So, my obligation is to introduce a lady. Whatever. Well, let's see. I won't say favorite because I'll get into trouble. <laughs> One of our wonderful colleagues, the Nicholas. She will be your first speaker uh, this morning. She's a curator here at the Wilsonian. Um, she's worked closely with our founder, Mickey Wilson, for almost 40 years, um, helping and guiding and following his endeavors as he's created and put together this incredible collection. She's assisted in building out the Museum, Museum Collection Educational Programming researching and managing the collections. Um, exhibitions she's curated. If you stay in the building, you go up and see the Harry Clark and the Geneva window. That was Lee's exhibition. She curated and worked with the design team here, a few of the team here. Area Visions, for those of you who have been on the beach for a while, it is in 2021. Plotting Power Maps in the Modern Age Vision. Uh, 2022, another exhibition, which there is still a publication available in the gift shop for that if you want to check it out. She has a BA in studio art, studio art from Scripps College. She's also a multimedia artist. Every once in a while, some of her pieces show up in the gift shop for a <laughs> So keep an eye out. So today, she's going to delve into the MIDI. And sorry, she's going to delve into MIDI of the Art Deco architectural features that make up the whole science collection and that are ingrained in the architecture of this building. So this should be a very interesting talk. I know that I've had the opportunity to hear her talk about this before, so I think you'll be very excited to learn more about what we got going on here at this time as it relates to our Becca. Lee. Thank you, Casey. See, so nice to see all of your shining faces here today. Um, yes, I'm happy here to talk about our Deco, but a little bit different than perhaps what you might think, because this really is our deco. Through the lens of this place, this building, and, and South Beach. Um, so I actually wanted to start our talk with Henry Hohauser's magnificent art deco jewel um, that was finished in 1940. Um, it was located at 1611 Collins Avenue. Um, but unfortunately, by 1981, it was slated for demolition. Um, our founder, Mickey Wolfson, was at the time co-chair of MDPL, mm -hmm. along with Barbara Kappenman, and he was quoted in the Miami Herald with the following words as he tried to both educate and stop the bulldozer operator. Um, there's a special spirit, a special vocabulary to the building. There's a spirit, distinction, beauty. Just look at this building. The curving angles, distinction lies in the form, the architecture. You can see it all around you. Barbara Kappenman wept. Mickey and others threw themselves in front of the bulldozer to no avail, unfortunately. The building was ultimately raised. But what was interesting is that um, this, this particular moment really served as a catalyst to um, inform the larger community about the need and resulted finally in the ordinance that we have now protecting um, the <laughs> South Beach's architectural gems. Um, so I just wanted to start out with that. Um, so it also impacted Vicki Wolfson, I believe, um, in that even today, people often refer to himself as a preservationist rather than as a collector. Um, and he has collected through the years many architectural elements um, that were that were captured from buildings that were raised um, of the period. So a few years after this, in 1985, um, Nicky Wolfson purchased the Washington Storage Company and its building that you are in right now. Um, the building actually served as the ad hoc headquarters for MTP, MTPL, by the way, because Jim Matthews, who was the son of the builders of the, of the original building, was a huge supporter also of the preservation of South Beach. Um, so the building was, this is a photograph from perhaps 1975. Um, notice the sort of hexagonal windows that were in place at the time that provided um, sort of windows for what was going on at the time. There was some retail space in here and a shot called Definitely Deco. Um, this photograph really captures, you know, that moment in the 80s and, and how, how the South Beach was at that moment in time. Um, 
So in, in 1985, as I said, I you know, purchased the building um, and proceeded to do, you know, major major risk with renovations and uh, added two, two floors to the top with Sarasota, Sarasota School architect Mark Hampton at the, at the helm of this project. And Mark Hampton was extremely thoughtful in trying to imagine how to integrate some of these architectural elements that Mickey had in the collection into the fabric of the building. And so the two floors were added, the sixth and seventh. Um, and this is what, so going back in time, now we're never going back in time. I'm starting back now with the, well, the idea of how the building came about in the first place. So um, there were two brothers, James and Edwin Nash Matthews. And um, Nash Matthews happened to be on the train coming down from the north with Newt Romy and, and was a conversation with him. This was just the month after the Great Hurricane of 1926. And Newt Romy, who had just completed the Romy Plaza, was, you know, quite upset, talking about all the damage that had been done to the Romney Plaza. Um, Nash, who was a uh, Princeton-trained um, engineer, had a, a, you know, light bulb went off in his head, and he thought, why don't we build a fortress against the elements? Um, his clientele would be the wealthy winter residents on Miami Beach at that time. Um, Miami Beach and other Florida resorts had really boomed in the 1920s, in part because of more ravaged Europe. <laughs> the Italian, the French Riviera, they were no longer available. So, the, so this was a moment in time when the American Riviera, Riviera really developed. So Miami Beach was really a place where a lot of wealthy Northerners came, built man, mansions, lived here in the wintertime, and departed back to their um, northern homes in the summertime. Um, so I wanted to kind of point out, though, how regionally um, different things were when, when Washington Storage was first built. Mm. Okay, so here's the Washington Sunburst 1930, and you see how sparse, incredibly sparsely, um, situated South Beach was at that moment. Um, but even just five years later, things had changed drastically. That's, so that's another really interesting thing to absorb about this period of time in South Beach. The rest of the country was in a great depression and not getting on as though you know, Florida wasn't already experiencing a depression, but it also seemed to boom in some strange way um, during this period of time. Growing very quickly. What just happened? Okay. Um, also, I just had to show this photograph um, because I love it so much. Um, one of the aspects <laughs> of the storage building, um, Matthews would even take your automobile and bring it in for storage over the hot summer. They would uh, drain the fluids, um, deflate the tires, cover it in tarps, so and when you came back in the fall, your, your automobile was in pristine condition, as well as all of your other household. Um, so, but again, in this idea of, this is 1930 in the United States, but by 1935, the brothers were realizing that they needed to expand their, um, their buildings. So the original buildings you saw in the previous image was three stories tall, and they built it with the idea of adding, of capacity to add two additional stories. So in 1935, they started getting architects plans for three additional stories, and this is one of the proposals. And you can see how, in this case, the architect is really looking to kind of create a bit of a modernity, a sense of modernity to the building, and, and enhance the retail aspect, of it, the first floor retail aspect. Um, but this is the architect that, um, that was the action winning architect, Robertson, who was one of the two uh, it was Patterson and Robertson who did the initial first building, so one of them, Robertson, did the two additional, was chosen to do the, the two additional stories, which were completed in 1936. Um, so there was a lot going on in this building, too. There was storage but then on the first floor. There was an art gallery. There was an interior design gallery. And so the Washington Galleries was responsible for the interiors of a lot of the hotels that were being built in the 1930s, and there was a huge boom in that moment in time. 
the Albion. The Albion Bar was designed, and they also provided furniture for some of the hotels. And so then you take us to where we are now. This is what the building looks like now, with the two additional floors designed by Mark Hampton. Um, so now what I'm, just going to, what I'm going to do is take you through sort of a chronological tour of architectural elements that are embedded in this building, that, that, that are Art Deco inspired. And even though this piece is what we often think of as pre-Deco period, um, I think you could really see how already by 1918, these architects were um, developing a style that was going to be leading more to more defined Art Deco style with the the simplification, the stylization, and the symmetry of the form here. So this is for this very grand university club that was in St. Louis built in 1918. Uh, and here we have, actually this is the only non-American piece um, that I will show you, and you can see these. Oh, I, didn't, I neglected to say this grill you will see if you go out and next to where the fountain is, on either side of the fountain, you will see this grill. So all of these cases, with, with two examples, you, you will be able to walk around the building and look out afterwards if you are so inclined. So these doors actually are to the entrance of, the, uh, of our design store, our design shop, and they were originally from the, the fair in Milan, which actually still continues on today, the, the Milan fair, but these are from 1936. So this is, um, an Italian take on um, early uh, stylization and, and deco. You see again the symmetry um, and the use of these simple white forms, while still within a more traditional context here. Um, and this is a building that was built at the depth of Miami, south of Second Avenue and the Miami River. It was a Ford and Lincoln dealership. And I'm actually not even sure, I actually don't know for sure if this part was ever actualized. I haven't seen it, but this part certainly was. And the architect is Robert Law Lee, who was a very interesting fellow. Um, he had fought in the First World War, comes back to, comes to Miami in 1919 and begins his practice as an architect. And he, like other architects you will see, is sort of transitioning back and forth between um, the more traditional form of romance and then the move towards modernity and what we are now referring to as an Art Deco style. So you kind of see that in the form of this very grand pillared building. Um, that was for a car dealership. Um, what we were able to um, acquire from Dave Heritage Trust, the building was destroyed in 1983, um, and Dave Heritage Trust, I guess, was salvaged below this coffered ceiling, um, and Mark Hampton was able to imagine and figure out how to integrate this into the building. So when you go to the sixth and seventh floor, you can see it is the the top ceiling. And while it looks a bit, um, you know, traditional, like the ceiling you might have seen at um, the Biltmore, for example, when you look more closely, you see these references to automobiles and what actually is called right tires, cogs, the mechanical elements that were part of the, of the um, design. And also you see this, we have also the, there are two massive chandeliers um, that Vicki Wilson likes to reference as um, a reflection of Miami as the magic city, which sort of was referred to as that time, and it almost looks like Aladdin's lamps that are making the, the uh, form of that chandelier. So here you go. Um, this was a time, eminently, when shopping for a car was a much more glamorous event than it is today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, see here, you see here the... Um, yeah, I have to keep changing here. Uh, you see here, the, the you can see the chandelier up here. That was the ceiling you barely see, but you can see the chandelier. I mean, this was a very grand uh, space um, in which to go and, and purchase your, your automobile. And talking more about Robert Law, I apologize for the, the poor quality of this image, but I just had to show it. Um, so in the same year that he was creating that Ryan building, this is the... Um, 
this was a, a um, apartment building in Miami Shores, and then you see in a very traditional Mediterranean style, and then I got to include it because I moved here from oh, down in here. <laughs> and, yeah, this was my apartment, my cat. <laughs> Uh, but then, just a few years later, and again, um, not a great image here, I couldn't find anything, but these are the beautiful shrine building, also known as the large shop stand, which is just across from the Adrian Arch Center. Um, it was originally the Mahdi Temple. Um, they built it, and they had the upper floors, but the bottom floor is from retail, as you see, they would have been in its place right there in 1930. Then, um, Robert Lovett Lee, just a few years later, 1933, this is a, a drawing in our collection um, for the Florida House for the 1933 World's Fair in Chicago. Um, this incredible uh, tropical living image. And you see how he has really transitioned, right? A very modern style. And this is where it stands today on Lake Michigan. Um, and as I was doing the research just recently, I found out two days ago, it went on the market. You can't actually buy it because it belongs to the National Park Service, but you can acquire a 52-year lease for $2.5 million, <laughs> in case anybody's interested. So this is another project by Robert Lobby, which I didn't know about. Um, and it was a WIMG transmitter building on Cameo Island, which it was, it was named Broadcast Island later, but it's, it's where I believe Channel 6 is now, 79th Street Causeway. Um, so I think this building was raised at some point. I don't have any idea when it was raised, but I think it really shows a quite an elegant, um, sophisticated approach to modernism on this part. Okay, so our next object um, embedded in the building is the wonderful letterbox, which is just right out there in the elevator for you to the left of the elevator. Um, so this was for the New York Central Station in Buffalo, New York, um, which was this really hugely interesting space. We also happen to have, um, although not on view, we also have two of the lanterns that you see there. And then, really, um, the Julian Art well, crown, well, as far well, as Art Deco um, icons goes, is the objects that we were able to acquire, or we keep able to acquire from the Norris Theater, Norristown, Pennsylvania. I mean, you see this, the, of course, the frozen fountain motif, the incredible symmetry, just the glamour of it all. Um, and the facade that, that we were able to acquire and then use as our entrance piece, it really is an iconic. Uh, is that, that people just know that we're at the Wilsoning when you see that, that image. Um, we also have two from the, and so this is something that you would have to get permission to come see, but it is in the building. These are in our boardroom. And from, these would have been in the foyer of the Norris Theater. So I open it up, you see, um, Norris embedded in the stained glass, and here we have images of music and musicians, and here we have images of uh, relating to modernity and skyscraper, and also music, and, 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 and um, movies. Um, so, so the interior, incredibly glamorous, um, and this was, this was um, all done by a very important theater architect, um, who interestingly enough, um, one of the things that, that, that we found out about him is that when Mickey's father, who was also in the theater bill business, um, did his final theater, which is the Bill Miracle Theater um, on Miracle Mile, he used the same architect, Charles Lee. Um, but you see what the point of the incredible space this was. This is the floor here again. Um, oh, the other story that I want to tell, though, I didn't tell the story, which I quite, I'm quite very, very uh, proud of finding out, which is very, very strange. Um, but this theater, the Norris Theater, was, was, um, was actually built by the Soblowski brothers. 
Um, it was the with three brothers who had a chain of theaters um, in Pennsylvania. A few years ago, uh, Mr. Wilson did his DNA test, and I looked at matches on his DNA test, and I saw the name Sobolski. And so I tried to figure out, I, I messaged Mr. Sobolski, and I said, by any chance, um, are you related to the Sablowskis who were involved with the theater business at Pennsylvania? And he said, yes, that's a matter of fact, that's what I found the was. So Mickey is somehow, we don't actually know how, <laughs> the cousins to the Sablowskis who built um, this, this particular theater. Everything's connected on this thing, let's see how we start on okay. Okay, so um, another uh, beautiful object that we have are the elevator doors um, in front of this hotel manager in Boston. These are also in the elevator lobby to the right, if you look. Um, so these are these incredibly beautiful, they're quite, you have to look at them carefully with all these depo motifs. Very much so, the building was built in 1930, you know, right just as the Depression was starting. Um, right here in this room, as you see these incredible lighting fixtures um, that we don't know very much about this building. The building itself was, was sort of in this rena you know, neo-Renaissance survival style, but somehow in the auditorium are these really incredibly modern um, light fixtures. It also had demo features, incredibly rare at that moment, sort of on the cutting edge. Um, and I can't tell you how many organizations, people I've tried to talk to, to find images of in situ, and there don't seem to be images of the auditorium at, um, at Hamley Junior High, which was, of course, torn down in, 19, in the 1980s. Um, so if anybody has any connections in St. Louis, and those of anyone who went to Hamley Junior High, that was really yeah. helpful. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I keep changing from these. Okay, so there was this uh, trend, of course, to modernize uh, at this moment. So um, Henger, which was a department store in Buffalo, uh, had the original building was from 1903, um, and it was just designed to completely sort of create a new modern aspect to, to this building, uh, including these incredible st um, street front invisible windows, which you see here in the um, these would be invisible windows. We have two of these invisible windows, and those are, when you go into the elevator lobby, they are on the walls behind yeah. you. Um, and they featured a curve, originally they featured a curved glass that made it appear optically as though there wasn't any glass in the window. Um, and the the dealer who, who sold us these windows said that the person who the people that he got the windows from were telling him the story of how when they were first installed, people driving by or walking by, well, first of all, they, they would stop their cars, but they would also go put their fingers on the glass because they thought there wasn't any glass. They thought the glass was broken, so they couldn't keep the glass clean. And it was creating such an uproar that they actually changed the glass out to just regular glass and something like right? um, But what you see here, so you see the windows here, but you also see things really beautiful um, plaques here, and we have two of these, um, and, it, and, and they are also in, sort of to the side in the <laughs> actual air body, so there's a lot to look at when you, when you depart this room. <laughs> um, and then here from Miami, uh, these are also, these were also salvaged by Day Heritage Trust when the, the DuPont building in downtown Miami was doing a renovation in the 1980s. Um, and these are in the stairwell. So if you ever walk up our, our stairs, every floor has one of these which um, we use to identify the floor number. Um, and so my final uh, object to talk about is the Bridge Tender House, which is out on the, on the uh, street out here, which you came in. And, and so this was a, this was a, also a WPA project, and that was that was done in 1939. 
Um, we were able to acquire, there were two of them. We were, uh, one is in very bad condition now, so we were very lucky that we were able to receive this as a gift from the Florida Department of Transportation and renovate it. Um, and come, it, it becomes a space that we use for, sometimes for artists um, in, integrations at our artist events, um, have poetry readings, different artists sort of take over the space and create different different um, events in them. Um, and right now, actually, when you, when you depart, you can sort of peek and look in. Um, right now, this bridge from deconstruction site project has been going on with local artist uh, Misael Soto uh, and his Department of Re Re Reflection. So be sure to um, take a look at that. <laughs> so that is actually my review of Art Deco here in this building. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, let me come on back with the mic so that we can hear you. Hi, I was just wondering about these light fixtures. Are they incandescent? What's their source? I think, Richard, do you know they're incandescent? Well, uh, their turns out south have a tubular hole that makes these other ones are still in place. They're called little line bulbs that are manufactured and built. And they are the one that do it. So, we're in the process of trying to do it. The last way to mine, I was going through some other side of the valley in the year. They are they Any other question? I'll come down. I have one quick one. When you showed the photograph of the Washington Storage Building, was that, that the old city hall um, living, living on was? So I think what that one, <coughs> one of the photographs I think was taken from City Hall. But uh, let me see which one you were talking about. Let's go back, sorry. Mm -hmm. no, no, that is the hotel. Um, Black 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 Black. Yeah, Black. Oh, okay. right. So I think this picture was oh, actually me south. Right. More. Okay. South. So I was trying to figure out. Okay. Oh, wow. And look at this great, look at that great. Um, Gas station on the port. That's what we bought. So, so what year? This was 1935. Yeah, I'm single. I'd say. Okay. Oh, also the buildings that you talked about and the different pieces that you showed. Do you have a favorite? <laughs> or is that the guy you want to ask? The buildings that are my favorite. I yeah I know that this it's really hard for me to say that I think some people ask some people ask Mickey Wolf so like what is your favorite object Oh my gosh <laughs> it's like an impossible question actually um, I'll say this this is my favorite that'll be my answer no, not me I do think you should tell the inspiration um, you know my we had no identity and um, the early architects were trying to give us some sort of uh, architectural identity. And the first identity we had was his Stanaho-esque. Um, did you know the Biltmore in uh, Carl Gables and the Washington Store Building? It is, uh, it is inspired by the World Library in Salamanca, in Spain. So it had nothing to do with Art Deco, it had to do with the kind of loosely Mediterranean style architect which they wanted to hear, the new Riviera, its identity. It went out of fashion with a set world war. And uh, after that, we looked for a new identity, which was modern, sneak, positive, and um, um, kind of uh, celebrative. But uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in, a new, in a new architectural vocabulary, so we moved to the modern style. But the, the Washington Storage Building with the Bill Moore and, of course, Freedom Tower downtown, or remnants of the Sistano Moore's early identity to, uh, to uh, the South Florida. And the building on top of it is borrowed from ancient um, 
Roman architecture. It's called the Lindigena, and you see it in New York all the time, on top of these skyscrapers that were built in the 20s and 30s. You see Greek temples and Roman uh, villas, and on top of us is the model of what's below us. And uh, um, so the, the top two floors uh, is uh, the bottle of, of what's beneath, and it sits on a, the pedestal of the original building. And we didn't do anything spontaneous. It was all starting. <laughs> you know, this is not, I'm glad I didn't hear the word, but this is not a museum. Uh, that went out in the last century. Um, the muses are settling in, but haven't quite permanently settled here in Ireland. And thus, um, I like to call it um, a documentarium. This is uh, a, a place where you find uh, documents that recount the history of the period 1885, loosely, to 1945, uh, 60 years. And we don't collect nationalistically, that went out in the last century too. We collect linguistically. Or we collect men and women who make things speaking one of seven languages um, German, Dutch, Italian, English, um, Russian, um, Slavic, Russian, Japanese, and the most curious one of all is Celtic. Mm -hmm. It's the only museum in the nation which does collect uh, the Celtic Revival and one of the greatest masterpieces of the world. And I see that proudly it's upstairs. Uh, I love that Lee placed yeah. the saying of the Prime Minister of the nation next to the object, the most beautiful thing an Irishman has ever made. It's on the Okay, so that window is on display on the fifth floor, and I highly encourage you to go see it while you're here today. Signed by Harry Clark. Thank you, Harry Clark. I, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I'm from the area around Chicago, and I visited the Florida Tropical Home. I Robert Longbean and I not even share with everybody here. Um, they open it once a year. I believe the National Park Service has a tour of that home as well as other homes that were part of the Century of Progress exhibit in Chicago in 1904. Um, so if you're ever in intense shores. Um, I am curious if you could speak a little bit more about weed um, and in what collections there are in the Miami area that might uh, be of interest to a historian interested in this work. Thanks. Oh my goodness, I don't know where his archive resides, really. Do you know what? Um, it might, that's where I would look for some um, person. But I, I don't actually know the answer to that, to that question. There's some. Yeah. Oh. Um. I just have a very simple question. Yes. Um, uh, are you aware? Thank you. Were there anything saved from them that when it was destroyed? I don't oh, believe I, we we did not we don't have anything from the New Yorker and I don't I don't know there was a sign I noticed when I was looking. Um English. No, maybe as this picture it doesn't show up. There was a sign that said objects for, you know, something about things for sale, you know, another photograph that I had looked at. So obviously people were removing things from the building, but I actually don't know where any of the, of the remains reside at this moment. I think your lecture is fantastic. Um, can you explore a little bit more on the technology of construction 100 years ago, 1930s and 1940s versus today? And you know, I really like this, it's presented to a you, which is quite a great so best school in the U.S. That has to be retrofitted, uh, changes in technology, retrofitting, green water, concrete, all that. Right. We may need to ask uh, Richard some of the answers to some of those questions, but Nash, uh, who I mentioned was an engineer, went to great lengths in building. I mean, this building truly was built like a bunker with concrete uh, going deep down into the, into the ground as well as very thick 
um, poured concrete walls all around you. Um, we've had been having to do some renovations, of course, um, in recent years over time, and we're in, we've been in the middle of those for several years now. Um, working with some of the removal of the rebar and all of that. So that was happening, what, two years ago during, you know, so, yeah, during COVID, we were doing a lot of that work. But, it's all of that. So if you want to make it like a little library, um, our library is it's available to the public and it's only by appointment, but it does have an incredible value to so many people for so many participants in that terms of putting it there for the story or Yes, thank you for reminding us of that. Yeah, the, there's, a, there's great photographs of, of the whole process of building it. And it went up so fast, like in six months in 1927. When you think about how long it takes to do anything now, it's just amazing. Yeah, the permit. The permit takes six months, right? Any other questions from the audience? Well, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.